welcome everyone to what I think is our 20th uh, workshop of this type. But anyway, I'd like to turn things over to John and to welcome us. Thank you, Dave. And uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, wherever you may be, uh, we have a uh, wonderful international uh, uh, crowd with us today, uh, as always. Uh, I think, Dave, I think this is uh, Zoom meeting number 21, okay. uh, in fact, and uh, uh, since a year ago this past March. And uh, our Ivan meetings are uh, continuing to be ever popular, and uh, both MR Resources and Q1 Instruments are, are very, very happy to uh, sponsor these uh, uh, meetings. Uh, MR Resources, of course, has been around for uh, 35 years, providing uh, services, uh, magnet quench recovery, service contracts, uh, reconditioned NMRs and uh, the like. Uh, Q1 Instruments, a little bit newer uh, to the game, if you will, but uh, uh, Don Bouchard is with us uh, here today. Don, could you uh, uh, give us uh, uh, a couple of words on Q1, please? Yeah, sure, John, be happy to. We invite you to get to know Q1. Q1 designs and manufactures complete spectrometers from 400 to 600 megahertz for routine use in the research laboratory. Want to upgrade an older system? Q1 can retrofit AS and Ultra Shield magnets with complete upgrades, including automation, for less than you think. Q1 offers NMR instruments with excellent performance at an unbeatable price. Q1's operating environment is Spin Studio J. Spin Studio J has a plug-in based paradigm for extending virtually any capability, either internal to the spectrometer or externally via Java-based tools for extending data acquisition, analysis, and connectivity. The list of tools increases with every release. Here are a few graphical tools that greatly simplify operation. The Smart Tune and Match facility is fast and easy to use in both routine use and automation. Just select the nucleus and click start. The automation tool is a multi-user feature with user security and 1D and 3D gradient shimming is fast and reliable with shape pulses greatly extending the repertoire of experiments using our shape kit. And our patented deep learning NUS technology is unparalleled for speed and resolution. Q1 is innovated to produce the world's first multi-platform fully integrated into multi-platform probe fully integrated into uh, Topspin and VNMRJ platforms. The Q-Link Ethernet based interface can be installed on a wide range of consoles to fully automate the operation of older NMR systems and add multi-nuclear capabilities. Want to know more about our consoles and complete systems? Contact us for a no-risk demonstration of the Quantum One Plus console with the smart tune and match probe and full automation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. And uh, I would certainly encourage uh, uh, everyone to uh, uh, contact Q1, uh, have a closer look at uh, uh, the lineup of instruments. Uh, that said, uh, Chris, could you give us uh, some information on uh, upcoming meetings, please? Uh, thank you, John. I am actually interested to note that uh, we are losing track of the number, uh, which, <laughs> which is a good sign actually, in my opinion, that we, we don't even remember when we started anymore. It's just uh, uh, uh. well accepted. <laughs> um, so uh, I just wanted to announce what is coming down the pike um, in the uh, research topics, uh, workshop topics. The next one um, is in uh, on August 12th. Uh, I'm sure many of you might have received your, received an email. Uh, this is, uh, led by Brian Anselak and Bosch and Lomb, uh, on diffusion-based um, experiments, DOSI and, and diffusion. And um, he'll be joined by two panel members, Professor Gareth Morris from University of Manchester and Dr. Gergen Coles at Magritech. Um, following that, we do have a, quite a few lineup. Uh, we have uh, N15, uh, Natural Abundance N15 by Gary Martin, uh, F-19 technique for pharmaceutical dis drug discovery by David Russell. Reaction monitoring coming down the pike uh, by uh, Jason Hine at the University of British Columbia. Um, and then uh, Benchtop NMR uh, will be led by uh, Paul Boyer uh, at JOL UK. 
and we have two or three more um, in the pipeline. Uh, we will announce that, um, and we also put that in our website. Um, hopefully, you'll continue to support uh, this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, John. That, thank you, Chris. Uh, well, we've got a, a great workshop uh, uh, planned today around a, a very interesting topic. And uh, Dave, if you would like to uh, kick things off for us, please. Okay, I will do that. And I'll do that by introducing Jose Napolitano, our workshop leader, and he can take it away. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity. I want to start by thanking, uh, you know, the organizers, the sponsors. Um, I know that this, uh, um, you know, this workshop was planned originally for a couple of months ago. Uh, just another uh, example of how COVID has um, affected um, pretty much everything that we do with these days. So I want to thanks again the organizers, uh, the the sponsors, and all the users that you know log in initially a couple of months ago and that came back today. Um, you know we we have a very uh, nice set of topics uh, set up for the quantitation NMR uh, discussion. I want to thank our panelists, you know, Charlotte Corbett from the Drug Enforcement, Enforcement Administration and Gennady Kirik. Uh, we really appreciate having you uh, and provided you know, uh, some of the research that you have done uh, in the past. I think that it's going to be uh, a very interesting discussion and I'm looking forward uh, especially to the uh, to the Q&A session. That's one of the really interesting parts of, of these uh, IVAN meetings is the lively discussion uh, after all the presentations. Um, you know, before I start, um, just a few um, rules of engagement, I will call. Uh, you know, I will uh, start with a short introduction. Um, then uh, I'll go through the panelists I'll keep an eye, an eye on the chat during the whole time. Uh, after each presentation, uh, we will address maybe a couple of questions, uh, but we're going to try to leave the bulk of the questions for the Q&A at the end. Uh, I encourage everybody when the Q&A starts to, you know, actually, if you want to uh, share your question instead of just putting it in the chat, just talk. Uh, if you want to put the camera, that will be great too. All right, so, you know, um, quantitative, quantitative NMR, uh, I'll just start with a very uh, light introduction in what I think is quantitative NMR. It's pretty much an NMR, any NMR approach that allows to determine quantity. I know it sounds very simple, but it really includes a lot of things that we do every day. And that, you know, it could be uh, experiments that are specifically designed to to be quantitative, whether you do a, you know, a simple, a single pulse 1D with a long relaxation delay or uh, a nosy preset or 2Ds that you, we see coming more and more often these days. Or if you are just using, uh, you know, calibration strategies, uh, like our good friend analytical chemist will do a serial dilution or a standard addition curve. All these experiments give us access to quantitative information. And so I include all of them on the same, uh, on the same category. Um, I, I hear a lot and that, you know, NMR measurements are in, in, you know, inherently quantitative. And I always say that, well, it's, it's kind of sort of, kind of, not all of them necessarily. Uh, but, you know, if we assume that the acquisition and processing requirements have been met, then certainly we can say that our intensity, signal intensity is proportional to the number of moles. And you know, I think the question on the screens tell us something uh, very important is that all NMR, all quantitative NMR measurements are relative. You always are going to need something to compare. Um, even if all of them are relative, we commonly categorize QNMR measurements in kind of two pots, you know, like absolute measurements if we have access to some kind of reference standard. And these are, you know, the question that you see on the left it's a typical equation that gives you uh, access to content or uh, potency. Uh, we can also use uh, these uh, QNMR approaches in a relative way, in which we, we don't necessarily have 
uh, reference material for calibration, but we can compare two things within the same sample. You know, it could be we want to measure a ratio of, of, of isomers in a sample, or we want to uh, know the ratio of, of monomers in a polymer, those kind of measurements. Um, QNMRs, of course, is not new, and, and uh, I don't pretend to make this a, a, a very strict timeline. Um, I'm not a historian of, of, of the technique. Uh, but if you start looking uh, back uh, in the literature, you can find very interesting applications of things that even today we're trying to do. Uh, like this paper that I found from uh, Donald Hollis from uh, Varian at the time in 1963. Um, and you know, the first review that you see also over there. Um, if by any chance you go into publications that are, uh, you know, even older than these ones, I think that would be great. Please feel free to share. You know, after these first steps, we we start seeing the first applications. Um, you know, there was a lot of interest in carbon and uh, 13 NMR at the time. Uh, we also see how the foundation for metabolomics by NMR was slowly being built. Uh, interest in other nuclei. Um, you know, by the turn of the century, um, I think we really start looking into how to validate the technique and try to understand what are the limits. And there are, you know, the literature on this field is, is, is huge, but definitely on the mid 2000s, there was a huge push to try to understand what are the limits, uh, how can we validate this and start uh, looking at applications that are dear to me, specifically like uh, you know natural product analysis and toxins, uh, things like reaction monitoring, um, protein concentration, and you know since then it has not really slowed down. Uh, we continue to see uh, publications trying to help people uh, use these in a more you know with more confidence and and. Uh, understanding how to do some of these measurements for different applications. Uh, we have developments on, on validation interlaboratory study, and I expect to see this field continue to grow over the next uh, years and decades. So going to applications, I just wanted to share uh, a little bit of the work that we do. Uh, our group is a structural elucidation group in South San Francisco. We support mainly drug development, late drug discovery uh, and drug development. And we were fortunate enough to interact with a lot of people. Uh, you said, as you see in the screen, we have process chemists, analytical, uh, new compounds, formulations, some manufacturing. And yeah, you know, NMR definitely has uh, uh, a place to support all of the activities that we do in the interaction with these teams. When you think about what of these applications require quantitative data, you can argue that pretty much all of them uh, benefit from the use of QNMR. Um, whether you are uh, determining the content of a study material and intermediate and impurity, uh, or you know, um, helping with process development all the quantitative information, the access to quantitative information is very, very important for us. And as such, uh, you know, quantitative information is, is fully integrated into what we do. Um, it's kind of an end-to-end -end approach. Uh, we do QNMR in things from study materials pretty much to all the way to, to APIs. Um, and some of the applications are, you know, very simple things that uh, I'm sure that a lot of people in the audience are familiar with, like um, just the, the example that you see on the left, in which let me just use a laser pointer just in case. Um, the example in the left, in which you were simply doing content determination using an internal standard. Uh, or if you have uh, the, the example in the right, you can see that it's simply determining the, the mass fraction for a polymer and uh, having a calculation of the average number molecular mass for it. So these are typical applications for us that uh, our group do in a, in a daily basis. Um, lately, we have been pushing more and more uh, to, to do external calibration for obvious reasons. You know, we, we 
we want to simplify our sample prep. We want to avoid interaction. Um, sometimes we don't know exactly what's what's in the sample, and it's difficult to really predict how the addition of a standard could affect that. And you know, we do this in 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 ways that have been explained before, like um, trying to calculate a concentration conversion factor to some extent. Um, the application that you see in the in the right is just determination of an API contact in a, an amorphous solid dispersion. In this case, using the MSO2 uh, as an external calibrant. And you know, there, there are things to keep in mind when you are doing this type of analysis. There are additional corrections that might be needed depending on your system and, and what kind of, uh, what is the intended purpose of the analysis. Uh, in this case, I, I just put into that we use often just the pulse uh, correction, you know, the pulse length correction and a solvent correction for the active volume in the NMR tube. Um, more applications on the um, on the NMR. Let's see, so we we also do a lot of external calibration uh, without any deuterated solvent, especially. Um, to support our automations team, trying to determine solubility uh, for compounds of interest in, in, in a large battery of solvents. And, you know, essentially what we do is we have a known uh, amount of API in each well. We know how much solvent is being added and using external calibration, we can determine these, con these concentrations relatively quickly and share this information with our automation team. And this helps the teams understand, well, what solvents can you use to, to dissolve? What kind of stability you have? Some of these solvents might be used for as anti-solvents for a, for a crystallization process. Uh, another application that we do very often is, is a slightly different type of, of quantitative NMR. Um, reaction monitoring is something that we are very interested for, for obvious reasons working so close with, with process chemistry. Uh, you know, it, it, we use it for whether we want to study kinetics or we want to know the stability of a specific material or, or try to understand better the mechanism. Um, the example that, you know, the, the diagram that you have on the left is, is pretty much the setup that we will look for a high field uh, instrument. Of course, right now we're more interested in using low field instrumentation, like the example that you have in the right, that is simply the analyzing the stability of this dichlorodimethyl hydantoin over time in THF. Uh, and we can kind of track uh, how the, the dichlorodimethyl hydantoin degrades, the, the, the intermediate with only one chlorine and how the uh, final dimethyl hydantoin is, is, um, is generated. So, you know, before, before uh, uh, passing the baton to our first uh, uh, panelists, I just wanted to share a few resources. Um, you know, if you are interested in, in just general QNMR applications, I think that the, the publication from Joe and Christina, it, it's very telling. Um, if you're looking for um, applications in the pharmaceutical industry, there is this uh, this uh, special issue is kind of, you know, it's a little old, but still there's a lot of very valuable information in there in different applications. Um, the other two examples that you have in the in the bottom, uh, we have, if you are interested in metabolomics, I think this paper from the group in, in, Firen in Firenze is, is very helpful. And if you are looking for to get into reaction monitoring, I think the, the paper from Uli and, and the team in Bath is also very helpful. So with that, uh, I would like to to uh, pass the baton to Charlotte for the press, uh, first presentation, uh, continued in this uh, line about QNMR applications. Uh, take it away, Charlotte. Thanks. Thank you, Jose. So I'm Charlotte Corbett. I um, do a lot of um, QNMR uh, for forensic drug chemistry for DEA. And 
we've been developing methods for a long time. I do want to thank uh, MR Resources uh, for uh, putting on these um, group presentations and helping us all get together and learn different things. I do have to say that my statements do not constitute an endorsement by the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, Department of Justice, or the U.S. federal government or of any vendor or its products and or services. Our samples are somewhat unique. We don't prepare the samples. We don't actually really know what is in the samples sometimes. Uh, normally, we do uh, multiple techniques uh, to determine at least what controlled substances are in the samples, if any. Uh, and these are the this list is the main components uh, that we may quantitate in the samples. Uh, methamphetamine is important because if it's uh, more pure than 80%, which is quite common, then it's considered ice and the sentencing guidelines are more strict for that. And in 2019 for marijuana and hemp, there we've had to do more quantitation for that to determine is this hemp or is it marijuana? Even though PCP is something that we do need to quantitate, uh, other methods we found are much better than NMR. Sometimes, uh, since we don't separate components in a mixture, NMR just isn't quite good enough for some drugs to uh, do currently. And fentanyl, we do want to know how much is in a substance if it contains fentanyl. Uh, it tells us uh, why someone uh, didn't quite make it after their fentanyl use. Uh, so we've done some unique processing, mainly because we have mixtures. We don't control the samples. We don't exactly know what may be in the, in the mixture, but we're after a particular analyte, how much is there. And we also know that pH and other constituents can shift the uh, peaks in the spectrum. So our integration must shift with those peaks. Uh, we've built that in as well as um, we could decouple uh, carbon-13 satellites, but we've chosen instead to determine how much of an area is on either side of an integration that could be an, uh, from a carbon-13 satellite within the integration um, region of interest. For our samples, we always say that the lowest uh, region is considered the cleanest. Uh, but we need corroboration from other signals or peak height to know that that's true or not. We're not after saying, we're not strictly wanting to know exactly how much of everything is in our samples. For many years, we've used Agilent varying instruments and then have cust heavily customized VNMRJ, the software that comes with those instruments to process our spectra. Along with quantitation, um, using internal calibration, we also do isomer determination, identification, and structure elucidation uh, with NMR, uh, as well as that list previously of different compounds that we quantitate. We also quantitate all reference materials, so we have a, a good idea of the purity of them before they're used for analysis. As everyone knows, in 2014, Agilent no longer uh, decided to manufacture NMR. So we're put in a quandary to figure out how are we going to process our spectra? Are we going to be able to use VNMRJ or uh, do some other processing technique? What we uh, eventually did was to go with JOL and we have to thank them uh, for helping us to um, process the data still with our customization in VNMRJ uh, using Open VNMRJ and Oracle VirtualBox and CentOS, which are all free for us, where that's important. Um, and that's uh, how we've uh, kind of proceeded in the world of NMR for quantitation. So for us, uh, we're looking at almost everything is a mixture. Um, and we don't want our quantitation to be falsely high. So we need to know whether the uh, area that we're looking at to determine the purity has any other components inside it or underneath it. So because other possible constituents could create high results uh, if it's not accounted for or insured against. Uh, we, also in some of our compounds, there's uh, different structure conformations. NMR is so good at uh, seeing differences in, the, in one structure in a solution, uh, but sometimes that's too good and we see um, 
split signals in different regions of the spectrum, either because of acid salts or ketoenol tautomers or secondary and tertiary amid rotomers. So what we've found is to we can say, well, maybe in some of these peaks, we don't see all of the hydrogens a portion may be somewhere else. So we can um, know that some of these signals are not a, um, a full proton and some of the other signals somewhere else and still use that for quantitation. Heroin is an example of that. Um, and uh, at the bottom there, there's a couple that there should be four protons there, but there's 0.15 somewhere else in the spectrum. We don't, we tend to not use, integrate the 0.15 because it's such a small, um, percentage. Now, how do we know that uh, our integrals do um, agree with one another with the low integral signal? We always choose the low integral signal as our best and then look at other areas of the spectrum to see if those signals agree with one another. Uh, we um, found out that signal to noise is the um, highest, has the highest uh, portion of uncertainty in the measurement. Uh, and so using that in our calculation and the uh, percentages, uh, purity results from other areas, we know how much variance can there be between signals. And then we know uh, what signals can agree. We also use peak height uh, and, and then have a specific different uncertainty for peak height results. So for us, an, uh, NMR, QNMR is quite simple for forensic chemistry. We need a blank, and but the blank can be run before or after the sample as long as the same day and use the same solvent source. We're, we do use um, tubes that are um, one use tubes, uh, which is somewhat why we still use uh, internal calibration and not external calibration. However, I think uh, there's been advances in external calibration where uh, it, the tube itself may not be um, as important as it used to be, especially if you're using the deuterium signal to know the volume of the, that's in the, that the NMR itself is seeing. Uh, and we use just one sample uh, for the quantitation. Uh, or two if there's insolubles present so that we can prove that all the analyte went into solution uh, and a quality control sample. And uh, some of the laboratories, they'll just run the quality control sample every day. So it's ready for the chemist, so the chemist itself. They may only need to prepare their sample and, um, and uh, which makes NMR quite easy. And since it's not a, since samples don't interact with one another, uh, we don't need a blank between uh, each sample. If we, um, and we can also use a quality control sample of a different analyte. We don't, if we're quantitating methamphetamine, we don't need to use methamphetamine as a QC, we could use something else. So, um, and then we would require a spectrum of the reference materials just as uh, to know where, uh, how the sample signals look compared to the reference. But that does make, uh, make it also so that if you need to quantitate one drug in a sample, and maybe you can actually use the same sample and, and quantitate multiple substance in the, substances in the same solution by just reprocessing the spectra. So with our customized reports have the spectrum and our analysis and sample information, as well as uh, more insights of what signals were used for the, the uh, quantitation. Uh, and then a simple to read uh, information for the chemist saying whether it's reportable, or if we had other issues with the spectrum, if they need to rerun it for more signal to noise um, or anything else, and as well as the structure. Um, and this is, the, at the end result um, of the information that is given to the chemist. Uh, the other thing is that uh, when preparing the samples, we usually use a large batch of D2O, D2O containing maleic acid as our calibrant. And uh, the way, since we do that, we know that there's a maleic acid to TSP ratio that we should expect to see in the sample that would also be in the blank solution. So if those 
uh, uh, ratios agree, then we know that the malic acid, there are no other peaks underneath the malic acid and nothing in the sample reacted with malic acid. Uh, so for this sample, uh, many times all we need is the area and we always take the lowest values assumed to be most pure of any other overlapping signals and base our agreement with other integration va values within the sample um, based off of a, a medium absolute deviation of um, for the other analyte signals. And we also do peak height. If we have fewer than three integrals, which can be, especially if there's a compound that doesn't have three integral regions or there is more overlap, then uh, we'll also try to determine peak height and use that uh, to figure out if the integration um, information is correct or not. The way we do peak height is that we use the calibrant signal and use Gaussian Lorentzian line widths to make sure that the middle of that peak is three hertz wide. Then uh, do that both for the reference spectrum and the sample spectrum. And then from the sample spectrum, determine the heights of the analyte and compare those heights to the reference spectrum. In our insets at the bottom, we have all of our information for each of the regions of interest, the, the integral result and peak height if we need it, and uh, be able to, that helps us to be able to see the, the uh, regions of interest and see if there are any overlapping signals. And I just thank you for this uh, opportunity. And uh, VNMRJ, we're still using it. And thank you very much for Dan Iverson and Krish Krishnamurthy for keeping it alive. And we found it to be the most customizable and powerful software for processing NMR spectra. Um, and I'm sure some other uh, people have used that and are continuing to use the software for that reason. Then thank you also for MR Resources and for Ivan for putting on this uh, workshop. Thank you so much, Charlotte. A very interesting presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, we have time for a couple of questions before uh, we move to the next topic. Uh, the chat, it's, uh, we don't have any questions in the chat. It's, it's empty right now. If anybody has a quick question that they want to ask, uh, please feel free to unmute right now. We have a question from, from Gennady uh, asking, Charlotte, have you tried to use CRAP? for these measurements? We have looked into uh, and that would help, especially when there's some sort of baseline issues with using and um, um, uh, that would take, that would eliminate that. And uh, that would be, but we haven't implemented it yet. We have one. I'll take one more question. It says, uh, if you can explain a little more about the uh, satellite suppression. Um, and how yeah, are, uh, um, originally the older instruments, they didn't do as good a job on carbon-13 satellite suppression. That's why we implemented just subtracting the amount that would be there. Uh, newer instruments, they seem to do, do a lot better with carbon-13 satellite suppression. The other, th and not having artifacts, uh, the, we were also thinking of doing more junction of signals in the Peaks aren't fitted as well as they should be. Okay. Well, thanks again, Charlotte. Um, there are a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, Robert, Mike, uh, Dave, Marcel, we'll, we'll address those at the end of the presentation. Let's just move to the next topic for now, and then we, we will come back to them during the um, Q&A. Right, so, you know, for the second part of the, of the workshop, uh, I was thinking a lot about the things that make QNMR difficult sometimes, and that's why I decided to call this part simply like pitfalls and bottlenecks, just things that uh, you know, sometimes I don't think enough about, or, or you might be find yourself also struggling to deal with when you are doing QNMR. And, you know, the, 
the first thing that I that I thought about is just how how I commonly approach these measurements. And you know, this this roadmap that you see on the screen is a very general one, of course, depending on the type of the intended purpose or the type of calibration or the nature of the analyte, some of these steps might may or may not be necessary. Uh, but I just wanted to to show up a, a bunch of things, a lot of things that you will think about or you should watch out for uh, when you are thinking about doing QNMR. You know, assuming that you you have samples that you actually have to wait, but, uh, just pay attention to your minimum weight uh, of, of the balance. Make sure that it's completely uh, that your samples are completely dissolved. Um, if you are transferring or doing any aliquots or, or dilutions, um, you know, what's the best way to do it? Do you prefer to go by volume or do you prefer just to weigh and, and use the masses to get your, your, uh, your ratios right? Um, as you move into data acquisition, just um, pay attention to, to, to the temperature equilibration and, and um, you know, the, the topic of proper experimental setup of pro or experiment optimization could take uh, another full seminar, but just things to, uh, to think about. Um, is your signal to noise high enough? Do you have, you know, uh, do I need more scans like Charlotte was saying? Um, when you process your data, you know, do, do you have, do you need to apply a polarization? It is a good idea. How many, how many, how many zero fields you want to do. Um, if I do, you know, if I apply all these processing scheme, is it reproducible? Can I, can I reproduce it? Can somebody else uh, reproduce it? And what's the effect of all these uh, in the, in my measurements? You know, thinking in the next slides, I will go a little more about facing and, and, and baseline, but just think that I, I would like the, the audience to keep in mind if you are, as you develop, uh, QNMR measurements, you know. Um, moving into data analysis, like Charlotte also showed, uh, you know, that the quantitative analysis is not, uh, cannot be separated really from the uh, structural elucidation component or, or identification verification component of NMR. So, you know, think about it, does it conform with structure? Do I have any uh, Conformational, you know, they have multiple conformers to see any impurities, how they overlap can cause problems. And, and finally, the, 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 the big question is what do I measure really and, and how do I measure that? Um, I, I do not intend to, to answer all these questions, but I think that it will be, uh, you know, good food for thought and it will be very good to, to hear more about that during the QA. Um, you know, Thinking more about experimental experimental considerations, I I, I don't like recipes for NMR, so I, I I'm trying to give you a recipe without any measurement on it as much as I can. Just you know, pay attention to your to your acquisition times and the, and the size of your spectral width and and how all these parameters are relate to your digital resolution. Uh, do you have enough points to really define a peak? Um, What's your choice of, of tip angle? You know, if you are doing an internal, um, in internal calibration, you pretty much can escape with with a thirty or or or, or a forty five if you want. Um, if you are doing external calibration, it gets a little more complicated, um, simply because if you want to calibrate your pulses, uh, being at the ninety degree level, uh, will make that you probably can minimize those errors. You know, how how long do I have to to have my repetition time to be, and that's, uh, you know, that depends on on what's the application and 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 how do you want to perform your analysis. And the last topic is just um, then just reiterate the importance of of signal to noise when you can achieve it. Um, finally, the 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 two plots that you see on the on the right are just. Um, to reiterate the point of how important it is to do a T1 from time to time. Um, and I'm guilty of this. Uh, there's a lot of data that we run in. Sometimes we don't go through the motion of actually collecting T1 data for it. And you go with the um, alternative of just having a very long delay. You know, having that data is, is, is important. Uh, on the examples that you see in the screen, um, I wanted to point out the difference 
in the T1, in the, in the curve that you see for the residual solvent signal. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, the one on top is not a, it's an unsealed tube, not a, not a sealed tube. But, you know, especially if you want to use that signal to, for example, to correct the volume of the tube instead of using the deuterium signal, uh, that's something that you have to take into account. Um, then, uh, you know, what I think really can make or break our, our QNMR analysis is, is how you face and baseline correction, uh, how you do the baseline correction and, and facing. And I'm sure that all of you have seen the examples in which you see a simple, a single peak and, and, and you try to make it as symmetrical as you can and you, you try to make the baseline around it as flat as you can. Um, um, I'm sure that Gennady is going to have a lot more to say on that front, but I just kind of wanted to share with you an example of uh, some of the things that we do. In this case, what you see on the screen is a reaction monitoring and long-term stability study. These are 300 spectrum uh, spectra co collected over 50 hours. Uh, and there, there is absolutely no point on trying to do any manual uh, facing or, or baseline correction on these data sets. So the development of algorithms to deal with these problems, it is very important. And you see on top um, the results when the data, when the facing and baseline are less than optimal and our best try on the bottom. And you see that even if the trends on the left are the same, you it definitely has an effect on your data and on the results that you are going to uh, to share. Um, so you, the question then is to how do we do it or do we have to do it at all? Uh, and going back to the point that Gennady made on the question to Charlotte, uh, we think more and more about using craft for some of these problems is possible, uh, if possible, uh, simply because that, that really um, eliminate some of the needs for, for thinking about your uh, facing and baseline correction and, and how do you define your integrals. And, and the examples that I have on the screen, especially the one for the reaction monitoring, can be kind of complicated to define a, a, a integration range. Uh, but I want to show just one last example. Uh, this is my favorite molecule to, to try new quantitative methodology. Um, I tend to use ribose because you know it's a it's a solid, it's stable, it's easy to weigh. Uh, but as soon as you put it in water, then you automatically get uh, the four cyclic forms that you see in the screen, and that means that you it's really easy to get a mixture of four components uh, with only one weighing step. You know, and, and the anomerics for these four cyclic forms are well separated, so we can we can do regular integration or we can try curve fitting on the frequency domain, or we can try you know, time domain analysis with craft or, or even uh, the quantum mechanical base analysis, like the one that uh, softwares like, like Cosmic Truth can do. And then the results, the, the question is, uh, does it make a difference, any of these approaches? And, and you know, the table that you have on the bottom are uh, results obtained with different softwares for exactly the same data set. Um, you know, the first and, and last columns on this table are reference uh, uh, with, with uh, some information on the molar ratio. And you see that the first, you know, the MNOVA top spin, ACD delta, and JSON, they were all done just with, um, with the regular integration. Just, uh, automatic integration, but just looking at the at the sum uh, of the area. Uh, we try some curve fitting with, uh, you know, QGST and MNOVA and also FITIC, that is a, another piece of software that is very interesting for this purpose. And, but overall, you know, the, what I want to, to say about this table is that although the results are consistent across the board, uh, I hardly doubt it, uh, it, to me, it's, it's very difficult to say that they are exactly the same, especially when you see the, the results for the minor component, the alpha ribofuranose, in which the, the variability that you see between all those measurements is, 
it means a, about 20% difference between some of them. Um, so yeah, you know, these are the, the, the kind of things that keep me up at night when, when developing a QNMR, um, a QNMR method. And I'm looking forward to hear uh, more uh, about your take on those topics, on these topics during the Q&A. Um, um, so now for the, for the, I want just to take a minute to, to acknowledge all the people that make this work possible, you know, uh, people in my group and then and, and our uh, sister group, Process Analytical, um, uh, people across the organization and also from uh, Jill, uh, Ken Packer and NNMR Solutions. Um, and with that, I will, uh, pass the baton to Gennady uh, that is going to tell us more about the, the work that he has been doing uh, recently. Um, Gennady just uh, published a very interesting uh, paper in analytical chemistry. Uh, and I encourage everybody to, uh, to go and take a look. It should be on the ASAP uh, at this point. Uh, take it away, Gennady. Thanks a lot, Jose. Uh, Jose and and the rest of the the Ivan crew. First, I want to thank everyone for you know for inviting me to be a panelist. This this really is a great honor to share some of the of the recent work I've been doing. Uh, so let me just share my screen. Can I please get a verbal confirmation that you can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Great. So this is going to be a slightly different take on Q on Amar. Uh, this might. Might push a couple of people's buttons as I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna riff on some fundamental philosophies that people in QNMR hold very near and dear. But hopefully, at the end of the day, this will this will serve as fodder for some, you know, stimulating and engaging discussion. Okay, so here's here's some real experimental data taken from a P31 phosphonoacetic acid T1 relaxation series uh, on. Jose and Dave Russell's 500 megahertz magnet on the other side of the Genentech campus from where my lab is. And so I wanna emphasize the fact that this baseline is naturally flat. There was no shenanigans going on, no baseline correction. Uh, you know, on the left I have, you know, a zoom of the signal. It's a nice Lorentzian, it's, you know, phased pretty well. Uh, on the right hand side, I have a blow up of the noise strip, you know, with the baseline emphasized. I think everyone can agree that that baseline is pretty much as close to zero as, as you're gonna get naturally. And so we start to sweep an integral, you know, a very generous integral. So, you know, we get, you know, most of the signal area in there. And all of a sudden we see that the two extremes of the cumulative integral are not quite flat. And so you say, huh, okay, well, you know, that's just random noise. Those are some fluctuations. Maybe I can go out a little bit and eventually it'll flatten out. And so you go out a little bit and you see that this trend is not continuing. And at that point you say, well, hell, I'm integrating pretty far compared to the natural line width of that signal. Why, why is my integral not flat? So you reason, okay, let me, let me integrate just a little further and surely it will you know, just kind of oscillate around zero and you realize why is it not doing it? And this is, this is an observation that I've made time and time again over the last few years, and I've, I've contacted many people about this, and nobody could tell me what is actually causing this. So, you know, as any self-respecting NMR spectroscopist would do, a couple of months ago, I whipped out MATLAB and just started coding up simulations. Okay, so if, if, if we go back to this uh, experimental data before I talk about the MATLAB stuff, if, if you know, if we think we're clever and you know, maybe we, we, we just integrate the noise and exclude the signal. So if you remember, I calibrated the, the original integral of the signal to one, we see that, wait, the integral of noise here is, well, it's zero like we expect, but really there's a positive contribution that's about 20%, right? 18% of my original signal area. The other part is negative 16%. So that's pretty significant. And then if we look at the other side of the snow strip, we actually see that that's 33% of the available signal area, right? I, there's no actual signal area contributing to, to these regions. So this is all coming from noise, right? The, so there, there's something about the integral of noise that, that's not, not quite flat. So let's talk about noisy signals for a second. So any noisy signal may always be thought of as the sum of the pure signal and the noise, 
okay? And so remember, between acquisitions, if I have one NMR tube, you know, same sample, put it in my magnet, shim it up nicely, and hit go 10 times, I'm going to get 10 different spectra. And the only thing that should be different between those spectra is the noise strip that I get. The pure signal is always the same. It should be, right? The laws of physics and chemistry demand, right? Your, your sample is not changing in the tube, I'm, unless there's some funky chemistry going on, but let's, let's not talk about that. So what happens when we integrate noisy signals? Well, ju just, like, just like a noisy signal can be thought of as the pure signal plus the noise, we can always think of the integral of a noisy signal as the sum of the integral of the pure signal plus the integral of the noise, right? So every time you take a spectrum, you basically get one of these or one of these or one of these. And that's what gives you these irregularities in your cumulative integral of your signal. So the integral of a noisy signal is the sum of integrals of the signal and the noise. And so let's just, you know, let's just normalize, you know, for discussion purposes, let's just normalize the integral of the signal as one because it's convenient and, you know, uh, the integral of noise, that's random, right? Every time we, we take a spectrum, that, that integral is gonna be some random number, so let's call it epsilon. Uh, and if anyone's interested in, in more information about this normalization and particularly why it's convenient, you know, ch check out my paper, which I'll have a few more things to say about later. So it turns out that, you know, after a little bit of digging, it turns out that noise integration is something called a Wiener process, which is defined as a continuous time stochastic process, which we call double bleeding. And anything that's a Wiener process satisfies the following four criteria. But before I get to the criteria, so everyone's aware, this, 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 this is something that was discovered, I believe back in the 20s or 30s uh, by an Amer uh, American mathematician named Norbert Wiener. So the four criteria that need to be satisfied is that the Wiener process at time zero always equals zero. Well, we're not dealing with time, we're dealing with frequency, but you know, a number is just the number and we all know that our integral always starts at zero. So we know that this process should be continuous and that's true, NMR signals are continuous, but in, in actual experimental uh, scenarios, we're discretizing them. Uh, the components of a Wiener process are all independent, meaning the value at any time does not depend on the value of that function at any previous time. And last but not least, every component of a Wiener process is Gaussian with an expectation value of zero and a variance uh, given by, you know, given by some sigma squared. So you can just translate the math on top into, you know, just do a change of variable. So instead of time, we're really talking about frequency. And so what we're doing, you know, that epsilon, that imprecision in your integration of a noisy signal, that epsilon is really just the integral of noise over some frequency range R, right? It says nothing to do with time. It's just about labeling variables and having a sequence of random numbers. That's really what it comes down to. So since only the noise changes between subsequent experiments, the distribution of the integral of a noisy signal is governed by the distribution of the integral of, no, of the noise, right? Because the integral of the pure signal really never changes. And, and I just wanna say that when I say that the, the, noise, uh, the noise is the only thing that changes between experiments, I don't mean the root mean square of the noise, that's always gonna be approximately the same. I'm talking about the actual sequence of random numbers that comprise a noise strip. So, with the power of MATLAB, we can actually separate out the integral of the pure signal and the integral of the noise. And it turns out that the integral of the noise, uh, you know, for a single noise strip, this integral appears to take on an approximately linear tra trajectory with a random slope drawn from the Gaussian distribution that you see on the right. Okay, that's interesting. So these, these things are not really flat all the time, although on average they are. And so going back to the variance of these cumulative integrals of noise. So here, here I have 100, 100 different uh, noise integrals, uh, cumulative integrals, I call them trajectories. And if I integrate over some range R, you know, uh, I can get a distribution of these noise integrals. And these distributions were actually 
formed with, uh, I believe, 5,000 uh, simulations. And I can measure the standard deviation of this distribution. I can square it to get the variance and I can plot the variance versus the integration range. Wonderful, let's double the integration range. Okay, so we double the integration range. We perform 5,000 simulations uh, of that cumulative integral at that, uh, at that integration range. And we actually see that the variance increases and if we double that integration range, which is gonna be four times, the four times the original integration range, we actually see that we get this very nice linear relationship between integration range and variance. And so therefore the larger your integration range, the less precise your measurement. So let's switch gears a little bit, knowing what we know about noise integration and knowing what we know about the Wiener process, let's talk about linear corrections to integrals. And you're always gonna see the word corrections in quotation marks. And hopefully by the end of this talk, hopefully you will agree with me that quotation marks should be used. So a commonly adapted workflow in QNMR is based on the following chain of reasoning. The cumulative integral of white Gaussian noise should be flat and randomly fluctuating about zero. There is very little area being picked up at the start and end of the integral of a signal. Therefore, the cumulative integral of a noisy signal should be corrected to be flat at both the start and the end. And that's just simply wrong because one must ask, are these additional processing steps warranted? So here's a bunch of simulations of cumulative integrals of noise. And so if I integrate over that whole entire range, here's, here's what the distribution looks like, uh, expressed as a probability density. And if we are to apply a linear correction, we would do a best linear fit to each one of these noise integral trajectories. These are the so-called corrections and you would subtract them out and you would flatten the cone-like distribution of these noise integral trajectories into, into this much more flat, looking bundle and you when you look at the probability density of the noise integral you know at the same integration range r you actually see that it looks favorable right it looks like your measurement is a lot more precise so of course we want to correct our integrals right because we would go from something that looks like the left hand side to something that looks like the right hand side but here's the thing it can't actually be accomplished right? Because the exact noise sequence that we are interested in is always obscured by the signal and it cannot be accessed. So when we try to flatten our integrals, we're actually manipulating both the signal and the noise integrals, and therefore we are biasing the measurement. So another interpretation of a linear correction to an integral is actually related not to noise, but to baseline. Right, maybe you're working at very high signal to noise and you're going, oh, what's, what, what's Gennady rambling about? You know, no, noise is not a problem for me. Okay, but baseline still is. So if you do even the most conservative zero order baseline correction, you are going to either add or subtract a rectangular chunk of area that's given by the dimensions of your integration range times the vertical offset that you are uh, changing. Right, so your signal becomes a signal plus a constant, and therefore your integral becomes your original integral plus this additional rectangular area. And as a function of integration range, uh, this is linear. So let's forget the noise for a second, and let's see what happens to the pure signal when we actually try to flatten something, okay? So in this particular example, I have a Lorentzian singlet, no noise. I believe the line, the line width, uh, full width at half maximum was set to one Hertz. So right now I am specifically under integrating it just to prove a point. So 15 line widths. And here's what that integral would look like if I, you know, if I did a subjective, you know, linear correction. Okay, that looks nice and flat. Here's the thing. That's 100%. My original under integrated integral is just shy of 96% of the area. And now my flattened integral is taking another 5% or so away from the true answer. And so I just went from a bias of 4.2% to a measurement bias of 8.7%. And that's a relative bias change of 107% in this particular example. That's pretty substantial. Uh, 
So the moral of the story is that flattening the integral is not equivalent to a zero order baseline correction like some people uh, think. Baseline correction should only be performed visually and very, very, very conservatively because it is a very easy way to introduce unintended and unnecessary bias into your measurement. So linear corrections to integrals, not a very good idea, right? When you're fairly confident that your spectrum has a flat and centered baseline and when your integral isn't flat at the extremes, just ask yourself the following two questions. What exactly am I correcting? Nothing. And how does this process affect my measurement? You're biasing it. And although I wanted to have uh, some additional slides talking about broad signals, I simply didn't have the time. So I'm just gonna say, remember, these effects are even more exacerbated when dealing with broad signals. In fact, it was dealing with broad signals that led me to start thinking about all this stuff because all of these effects became apparent. So switching gears just a little bit, I wanna talk a little about the dependence of accuracy and precision on your integration range. So again, we'll start with a Lorentzian, you know, with, which has a line width of one Hertz. And uh, I'm gonna start working at a relatively low signal to noise ratio of 25. So we can actually run simulations on, you know, how is the integration accuracy affected by the integration range? And we see that, uh, you know, if you're integrating 10 times the line width, you're at about 93.5% uh, accuracy. Uh, when you're at about 64 line widths, you're just approaching 99%. Now, 64 line widths, you know, in some cases, yeah, that's achievable. In other cases, you, you can't actually achieve that. There's, there's overlap with other signals, right? There's spectral crowding. If you want, you know, e even at 100 line widths, we're still just scratching the surface of 99%. But we already established that the larger your integration range, the larger the variance of the noise integral. And the noise integral is the main source of imprecision in your QNMR measure. So therefore, the integration relative standard deviation should also depend on integration range. And we actually see that it does. It's almost linear. It's not quite, um, it's, it's actually, I believe, a square root function, right? Because it goes the root of the variance. Okay, so we can actually combine these two plots into one parametric plot. So we start at 10 hertz, we sweep up to 100 hertz, and you see that there is an apparent trade-off between the accuracy and precision of integration. And so this trade-off depends on line shape, including the line width, the multiplicity, it include, uh, and, and it certainly depends on the signal to noise ratio. But remember that real QNMR measurements involve taking ratios of two integrals, but it turns out this general principle still holds. And so the accuracy and precision criteria for a given QNMR application should actually guide your choice in this trade-off. Now, I know some of you are probably sitting here going, oh, signal to noise ratio of 25, you know, what's this chump talking about? Let's do something at higher signal to noise. Fine, signal to noise 150, since that's oftentimes touted as, you know, the, the, the minimum needed signal to noise ratio for a quantitative measurement. Okay, so my X axis changed. Uh, so basically, you know, if you want that 99% accuracy, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna integrate out, you know, let's say 100 Hertz, that's all well and good, but your percent RSD is still about one, you know, it's just over 1%. You know, in some cases that is absolutely fit for purpose. In other cases that might not be so well. You know, if you're, you know, if you're doing some ultra high precision QNMR measurement then you need a 95% confidence interval of less than 1%, your 95 confidence interval over here at the signal to noise ratio is about, you know, 2%. So last but not least, I just wanna do a shameless plug for my recent paper, which has to do with uh, a general approach to thinking about and calculating uncertainty in QNMR. Uh, and so it's basically a very general Monte Carlo based approach to calculating both systematic and random uncertainty in QNMR ratio measurements. And, it, it, and what it does is it, 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 it provides a platform for eliminating the necessity for taking spectral replicates. And it eliminates the necessity to think about signals as originating from very specific molecules at very specific concentrations. Um, the effects of acquisition parameters and processing schemes, including appetization, 
um, on QNMR uncertainty are revealed and discussed. There's actually some really interesting observations about, about the effect of line broadening on your precision, which is uh, quite counterintuitive to standard dogma. Um, and the effects of integration range and signal to noise ratio on QNMR uncertainty are explored. And last but not least, they do a formal comparison between QNMR uncertainty from integration and line shape fitting. So with that, I wanna thank everyone for your attention and I'll, I'll be glad to take any questions. Thanks so much, Kennedy. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to go through, through these findings. It, it is truly revealing uh, how we um, pretty much don't think about the noise in the way that we should. And you know that other fields, uh, you know, high energy physics, are, uh, yeah, they have to think about it. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm looking at the chat right now. Uh, we have a, um, we have a comment here from Marcel. Let's see, it says, Gennady, very interesting observation. I had similar problems with noisy signal integration. Some found that it's super hard to get a reliable, accurate basing and baseline correction on these, uh, which does influence it all. Um, said, in practice, I had the best results by increasing signal to noise uh, as much as possible and cutting integrals consistently as short as possible. So have you tried this? Okay. So much to say on that. <laughs> okay. For, first of all, um, you know, some, sometimes depending on your purpose, working at high signal to noise is, you know, that's absolutely a workaround. Um, for, for those of you who don't know me, so I work in a very different area of Genentech than Jose. So I actually work in uh, something called the small molecule process impurities group. And what our bread and butter is, is looking at trace small molecule impurities on the order of one microgram per mil or less. I mean, these days we're actually going down to 250 nanograms per mil or less, um, you know, floating around in a giant sea of protein. So, you know, we can get very decent signal to noise ratios and get good quantitation, but you know, when, when you're looking at things that small, you know, yeah, that, that small in concentration, you know, you, you can't get like a signal to noise of 500 or a thousand on. Um, I, I would imagine some of the metabolomics folks would agree with me here. So sometimes higher signal to noise is an option. Sometimes it's not. Now, you mentioned cutting integrals. Okay. Sometimes appropriate, super dangerous. Why? If I'm comparing a singlet to, remember a QNMR measurement is a ratio. So if I'm comparing a singlet to a singlet and the two singlets are have exactly the same line shape. Let's pretend I have two samples. I have analyte one at, sorry, I have an analyte at one concentration. Next sample, I have an analyte at a second concentration, same analyte. So it's the same exact peak, same exact line width. If I cut the integral short and I cut it exactly the same in both of them, then it turns out when you take the ratio on average, your bias is gonna cancel out. But if you're comparing a shortened integral of a triplet versus, you know, with one line width versus a shortened integral of a singlet with another line width, uh, you're going to get bias. And this is actually something that's explicitly covered in the, in the Monte Carlo paper that I mentioned earlier. Thanks, Gennady. Um, let's see, I have, let's see, from one more question from, oh, a comment from Mike uh, Bernstein. He says, very nice work. Um, the integration slope modification you describe is slope and bias. And if it is, yes. it should be banned. It should be banned. Absolutely. Right. That'll be our new mantra, Mike. It should be banned. <laughs> Let's see. One one last question before we... Uh, wait, wait. Sorry. Can I, can I just say something? I, I just yeah. want to go on the record that up until about two or three months ago when I started putzing around with this crap, um, I was correcting slope and bias every single time, because up until about two or three months ago, just like every single spectroscopist and non-spectroscopist that I asked, I used to think that the integral of Gaussian noise should be a flat, noisy line. Oh, it, and, and I remember part of that experience in which, you know, you, you submitted a data set for a few of, the, of us internally to integrate it, like just do your best. And yeah. the results were quite revealing. 
Yeah, um, they 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 were absolutely smeared, and and this was dealing with with, with the broad peaks that, that that I mentioned during my talk, which is exactly why this kind of stuff started to really become exacerbated and revealed. All right. Well, thanks so much, Gennady. Uh, what I'm going to do now is to uh, just um, you know open pretty much the the last part of our of our workshop that is the. The Q and A. You know, I invite everybody. Uh, if you want to put your camera and the bandwidth holds, uh, if you want to uh, to speak, we have a few questions uh, on the uh, on the chat that we can go through. Uh, but uh, let's just uh, start that process. Let me just a second. Uh, so thanks again to Charlotte and and Gennady for. Uh, um, for allowing us to do this uh, and for for their gracious uh, presentations. Um, let me just looking for the chat, sorry about that. Um, let's just get started with the uh, with what we have left in the chat. Um, I'm going back, let's start with a chronological order. So again, if, if any of you have a question that you have to uh, want to ask, please feel free to unmute yourself and um, and do so. Uh, if not, I will just go slowly through through the questions that we have over here, starting with uh, with what uh, questions remaining from Charlotte's presentation. See, going once. Can I, um, Jose? Yeah. Jose, can ahead. I quickly? Uh, this is Krish. Um, can I quickly ask a question? To get, this is to Gennady, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gennady, uh, this is very interesting. Um, so in, in any uh, modeling approach, frequency domain, time domain, computational domain, whatever, you, you, the, the noise is, translates itself into the uncertainty in the computation of the property that you are trying to measure whatever that property is. In, in your case, in QNMR case, it will be the um, inter amplitude or integral of the signal. So the theory that, um, the, the or I don't want to call it a theory anymore, uh, <laughs> your observations about um, uh, noise, how it behaves in the integral domain, which is um, not modeling approach, but in, in integral domain, uh, does that apply to uh, this uncertainties as well? So, in other words, if I uh, if I take the same sample, run several different signal to noise uh, conditions, and if I compute through a modeling approach, does the uncertainty distribution? mimic very similar to what you are seeing with the noise. Uh, I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around, is this the integral part of your noise that's causing all this, or is it the uncertainty itself that is causing these ups and downs? Um, okay, if, if I'm understanding your question correctly, Krish, the, in integration, it's, it's the noise that's causing most of the uncertainty. But there are, it turns out there are slight contributions from the acquisition and processing schemes, including, you know, sampling, line broadening, and um, zero filling. Um, for modeling, you know, I, I, I've, I've actually started playing around with this sort of stuff using uh, QGSD and MNOVA. And, you know, while, while I'm not ready to go fully public with that, what I will say is based on some preliminary results. Uh, based on some spectra that Jose was actually kind enough to share with me from some of the C13 QNMR studies. Um, I'm actually noticing a very similar uncertainty in the integration, uh, uh, sorry, from, from, from the modeling using QGSD relative um, to using integration. In my paper, I explicitly do line shape fitting versus integration. And there are definitely differences there where line shape fitting is a lot more precise for a given signal to noise ratio and processing and acquisition scheme. Um, and, and usually much more accurate, right? Because you, you, you don't have to think about integration 
range at this point, right? As long as you right. can fit that peak. But but the thing is, you know, in my paper, these are, you know, these are all toy toy models, right? They're all perfect Lorenzians. And, you know, in, in real life, and especially, you know, when, when your noise is apodized, right? I didn't really talk too much about apodization, but when your noise is apodized, it act, it, the Gaussian character of your noise remains, but there are what I call short range correlations that are introduced into your noise. And so because your noise becomes smoothened, right? It becomes smoothened. And so when you look at the base of a peak, especially if you're working at moderate signal to noise, you almost get these, it, it almost looks like shoulders, but not quite. And so what I found is that certain modeling algorithms cannot always account for that. And it actually introduces an uncertainty that's similar uh, to that of integration. I, I can't comment as to how a time domain based approach would react to this. You, you, I think you, you are the most equipped person in the world to answer that question actually. Um, but, but certainly the, the, the noise will probably be the, the most dominant um, contributor to, to the modeling uncertainty in the time domain. So, so extrapolating that comment, uh, high uh, acquired signal noise is still a good thing. Sorry, say, say that again. A very high acquired signal to noise is still a good thing. Yeah, it's still, it's, it's not just a good thing, it's an excellent thing when you can afford it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the key, what, what Gennady said. When you can afford it, yes, certainly. You know, Gennady was putting the example of, of uh, trace impurities. Uh, in our case, although we work on things that are way, way too, concent too more concentrated, in our case, the problem is time. Uh, sometimes the sample changes, so we don't have time to, to collect more scans. Um, so yeah, you know, again, as long as you can afford it, the signal to noise is is something is good to have. Yeah, and 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 also ju just to comment, and this is something again, sorry for all the shameless plugs, but I actually do explore all this in my paper. But you know, for a given signal to noise ratio, even something as moderate as twenty five, and I specifically focus on that low signal to noise ratio in the paper. You know you can get different uncertainties for different processing schemes and different integration ranges, you know, um, at the same signal to noise. So, so if there's a certain uncertainty that you need for a given application, you can probably pre-model it and figure out what kind of acquisition and processing parameters you need and what your quantification strategy is going to be. And you can just demonstrate from the simulation that, you know, hey, I'm showing that this particular scheme is fit for the purpose that I need, because maybe because maybe my application is ultra high precision and I need to demonstrate that I can achieve, you know, better than 1% precision, better than 1% accuracy. But maybe my you know, maybe the the application is completely different and, you know, something like plus or minus 10% or 15% is, you know, good enough for, um, you know, for that purpose. So I, I, I think it all comes down to applications too. Thanks again, Gennady. Any, any other uh, questions on the mic before we, we slowly go through the chat? Jose, this is Dave Russell. I was going to jump back to one of the questions that was in the chat. I think Mike, Mike Bernstein and I both brought it up. It's for Charlotte. Charlotte, could you tell us a little bit about how you QC for things like shimming in the spectra that you're collecting? Because that's a big problem for us. We look at the calibrant and we know um, it's usually, the calibrant is usually a singlet. But if the calibrant width is too broad, um, then we say uh, it's not good enough, need to rerun. Does that answer? Uh, uh, yes. Kind of your question. So you're you're looking at with a half height then, and um, not really the overall line shape, because you can you can imagine having a, a high order shim out and yeah. having a foot. You could have like a split piece. peak at the top. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're a little loose on that, but we also can see it since we um, blow up each of the integral regions if there is a problem. It depends on your uncertainty to how. Um, good that peak shape needs to be yeah excellent thank you but, yeah there we've had a 
also know that we need to shim the instrument frequently so that we can keep our shims good. And that helped a lot. So this is Dan. I have a question also for Charlotte. It's not a nitty gritty NMR question, but I assume your results have to go into courts of law. And I was wondering if it's difficult to convince the lawyers of the uh, correctness of these NMR things. It's almost more difficult to convince the chemists some ways they're so used to other techniques but because of the reports that we've given we've tried to keep things uh, fairly simple uh, they horrible or approximate at the top uh, uh, but if it goes to court usually uh, that hasn't been a problem or an issue especially if the um, chemist is confident in the result thanks yeah, thanks, Charlotte. I think that that goes pretty much on the same vein that the next question that we have on the chat that is if, if some of these measurements are corroborated by other techniques, uh, they point HPLC, but you know, uh, it's something that has to do has to be done often or that it has it, it had to be done at the beginning before people actually believe what was going, uh, you know, the results from the NMR. Just curious to see. Uh, how that works. Right, during development of the process, we did compare to other techniques for for integration and say, yes, NMR gives the same result as others. Uh, for samples of samples, we wanna be able to get our exhibits out as quickly as possible. So if we can get away with one sampling, we do that. And one technique is enough. We do that as well. Uh, typically, their purity is actually more important for intelligence reasoning over sentencing, and that's for that reason, too. Let's see, we have one more question, let's see, from Marcel. Uh, in, as you said, in, in, in cases in which there's sample avail available, have you tried doing this for Charlotte, uh, doing QNMR in triplicate uh, to check for something like weighing errors? Uh, we try to avoid that, but yes, um, and sometimes also uh, it could be that the mixture is not mixed well enough. We've seen that uh, readily, especially in methamphetamine, dimethyl sulfone, the crystals look the same, but maybe it hasn't been mixed enough. So we actually, our sampling routine uh, re requires grind the material to a very fine mesh, um, and then depending on the particle size that we have, we know, and we have to guess what the purity is, and then we know how much we need to weigh to make sure we um, have a homogeneous sample. Um, so that's always kind of funny. Sometimes we don't guess what the purity is because that's what we're trying to determine, and then we'd have to weigh more, but that's how we've approached it. Thanks, Charlotte. Mm -hmm. uh, see, there is one more question for Gennady in the chat uh, from Anthony. Um, I think we touched on this a little bit, but just if you if you can give us a little more, it would be great. Um, how does NMR processing artifacts, uh, you know, uh, affect that noise variance and integration? You know, the accuracy and precision. You know, uh, the especially he mentions the apodization at, that you mentioned at the end of the presentation. Um, Okay, um, I'm just gonna give one quick example about apodization. So if we think about a match that exponential filter, right? I think we can all agree that's the most commonly applied one. For, first, of course, we realize that, you know, if you have anything more than, you know, one peak in your spectrum, you're, you're only gonna match the exponential to one signal, not all of them. Um, but given that you have an apodization filter, um, even something like one Hertz, okay. You appetize your, your signal, your signal to noise ratio generally goes up, right? That's one of the main reasons people do this. Of course, the other main reason people do this is if you have truncated uh, time domain data, like which is very common with C13 QNMR, right? So you don't want those sync wiggles, you know, screwing up your spectra. So you're going to appetize it pretty liberally, right? With a one hertz line broadening. The thing is, even though, even if you use a matched exponential and your signal to noise goes up, consider the following scenario. I'm going to retake a new spectrum and I'm going to up the number of scans so that my new spectrum without line broadening 
is going to have the same signal to noise ratio as the first spectrum with less scans, but with line broadening. Okay. So two spectra, same signal to noise ratio, no, no line broadening. Yes. Line broadening. The question is which of these is more precise and the shocking revelation that I had from the simulations is that both for integration and line shape fitting, the precision with line broadening at one hertz is actually about twice as worse than if you would have just upped the number of scans and reached the same signal to noise ratio. So we, we are pretty much shooting ourselves in the foot by using yeah. some of these uh, processing schemes. Very revealing. It's, it's, it's just another example of, you know, here's the 17th million thing we always need to keep track of as we're trying to do, you know, good valid QNMR. And, and in some cases, the appetization is absolutely warranted. And, you know, the, you know, my, my current mantra, you know, given everything that I now know is, you know, the, the application of the QNMR measurement should, should drive these sorts of decisions. And if it's, if it's all suitable for its intended purpose, and as long as you're aware of these kinds of effects and artifacts, then you know, it should be fine. Very interesting. Thanks, Gennady. Um, sure. Let's see. Uh, thanks to you and Nicholas for sending the, the DOI for your article. I, I did it like six minutes later because I, I didn't read the whole thing. Uh, but let's see, one more question from Mike. Um, let's see, Ooh, sorry, the scan is moving around. Um, using your approach, Gennady, is there a way to specify an integration width that will be needed based on uh, this experimental signal to noise and requiring uncertainty? So if you have, if you have a uh, a set requirement for the uncertainty that you want to match and 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 you have the signal to noise can you can you kind of play the other way around and see how how big your integral will have to be yes yes you can absolutely do that um yeah exactly yeah if, if you already collected your data and you're stuck at a certain signal to noise you can absolutely play around with with the integration ranges and remember you're always playing around with two integration ranges because you know, you either have an internal standard or an external standard, right? But it's a QNMR measurement is a ratio. So you can absolutely play around with them. And moreover, you can all, like, not only would you get information on the, on the random uncertainty, but because integration range is very intimately connected to, you know, how much area you're underestimating from the signal, you can, you can predict what your bias is. In fact, once you know your bias, as long as you know, you, you trust all this stuff, you can just correct your measurement for that bias. Is, is that the way that you envision that this is going to be implemented in the future in software? Do you think that that's the direction that it will probably go? I mean, per personally, I, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Monte Carlo methods. So, you know, in my head, you know, I think it would be particularly convenient if, you know, MNOVA or Topspin or whomever had a nice little button, you know, calculate QNMR uncertainty. And that way you only take your one spectrum or two spectra if you're using an external standard. Um, and, you know, it, it just, you know, you just feed in a couple of, you know, spectral parameters. It'll probably automatically read all the acquisition and processing parameters. And, you know, it'll just run that Monte Carlo in the background and spit out the uncertainty. Now, you know, you know, the, the way I approach this problem, I, you know, in the paper, I try to cover a lot of practical points, but it's certainly not the end all be all. It's just the kind of proof of concept demonstration and maybe a platform to, to work off of, right? For instance, you know, I think, you know, one thing that I don't cover is, you know, any decoupler artifacts that might be common in let's say C13 QNMR. And I think if we want to get to that level, these, you know, it's actually not rocket science. You probably just have to reprogram some of these simulations at, you know, starting from the block equations, there's chemical exchange, the block McConnell equations. But I think once you have it at that form, you know, I think, I think that, you know, that could be a very robust, um, you know, platform to work off of to figure out where artifacts are coming from and, you know, and also simulating them and seeing how they affect your measurement. Thanks. Let's see, going through the chat, I have, uh, 
I have a, a comment and question from David Snyder, but I think he has a correction. David, do you mind if you add, can you tell us the whole thing? Yeah, no, I, I just was adding to in terms of just matched exponential window function. Uh, that that especially when you if you have a lot of truncation artifacts, uh, you really aren't uh, doing much. And and you if you have a lot of truncation artifacts and you have a signal that really isn't decaying much, um, you really are not doing much about the wiggles. You increase the signal to noise a little bit at the main peak, but you you aren't uh, losing that much of the uh, of the side lobes. So there's actually a good amount of power in the side lobes. And I need to check some of my code before I, I kind of release this. But from what I can tell, just running simulations myself, it looks like um, if you, there's actually some, depending on your decay, there's some decay rates where you can lose a lot of power in the side lobes, hmm. even more than you would with, an, uh, uh, with uh, just doing no appetization at all, depending on how quickly your signal's decaying. Wow. That's 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 fascinating. I mean, it, it's it's not that much more, but you still lose more. It, it's the 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 relevant. It's, if you it's an at, important detail. Yeah, if you if you look in the literature, the relevant figures of merit are going to be the um, something called the equivalent noise bandwidth, which tells you how much the uh, which is the square essentially of the noise to signal the scaling of the noise to signal ratio. It, um, so higher equivalent noise bandwidth, the, the, the more uh, noise you uh, let into your signal peak. Um, and uh, then the other signal is something called something like the, ma the, max, the, the maximum side lobe ratio or something like that, it's MSR, um, which tells you the ratio of the signal in your peak to the signal in the side lobes, power in the side lobes. The problem is when you look at a lot of the tabulated information, some of it might be slightly wrong. And the other thing is that they're looking at what happens for an appetization on a, um, on, on a flat signal, on a signal that's non-decaying, not a damp signal. Now, I know people have looked at damp signals because everybody quotes this line that matched exponentials give you the best signal to noise. And indeed, from what I can tell, they have, but I've not actually done the work yet and uh, track down the reference of the actual of that actual result. All I've seen is stuff dealing with, well, what happens if you have a, a, a signal that's undamped? <laughs> um, I, I, full disclosure, I'm, I'm working on a book chapter right now. So that's, that's how come this is all on my mind. Otherwise, I wouldn't even be thinking. <laughs> please, please send me a copy of the book chapter once once it's published. Yeah, this this all sounds very interesting. Write a note to do that. Yeah, it, it does sound. Thank you for sharing your paper. It's, uh, I wouldn't, uh, I, but for this uh, discussion, this I wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have been on my radar, but it looks very important. Thank you. Let's see, we have one one more question from the chat. Matthias from Finland. Uh, if line broadening is bad. Well, I don't know if bad is detrimental, let's say. Uh, uh, what about resolution enhancement? Like if you use a, a combination of Laurentian and Gaussian uh, functions, what do you yeah. think? So you th I, I haven't I haven't programmed my Monte Carlos to do any, you know, anything other than Lorentzians. Um, the method, you know, the, the method itself is so general, you can really plug in whatever line shape you want. You can even plug in an inhomogeneous line shape. I've been playing around with broad and homogeneous RNA resonances, actually, which just look like these asymmetrical things. Um, you know, you know, I'm not trying to say line broadening is bad. I'm trying to say that, you know, you one always has to keep in mind what are they using line broadening for in a given application. In some applications, you absolutely need resolution over sensitivity, and in that case, you know. That's that's the trade-off. Um, yeah, it's it's not inherently bad. You, you know, it, it's just about what what's the application and how is line broadening affecting the quality of that application. That's that's really all I'm trying to say. Thanks, Gennady. Um, you know, with that, I think that covers all the questions we have in the chat. If anybody has any question. Uh, Please go ahead. I want to 
can I add one small comment uh, to an earlier discussion today um, that was related to comparison of QNMR result with KHPLC. I think this was addressed to Charlotte um, at that time, and then discussion went on. And then we, we had this, the entire panel discussion today about QNMR being a ratio relative um, numbers and so on. But then we, we, we go back and compare a technology, one technology against another, uh, or one methodology within NMR to another. Um, and so we have to be very careful how we make these comparisons and, uh, and evaluate one technology or one methodology against, uh, against another. Uh, because anecdotally, I have had experience where um, we have had um, NMR-based magnetic resonance spectroscopy, meaning the localized spectroscopy-based QNMR analysis in, in in vivo spectroscopy against, uh, we had to fight against uh, histopathology, which is as subjective as you can imagine, because a person sit there, review slide after slide and score based upon whether something is darker or lighter on the microscope and then score it. And then we needed to uh, compare uh, a, a measure that was 0.95 correlation coefficient against the such subjective. So uh, as, a, as a technique, as a new methodology gets developed, we have to be careful about how we compare it to an existing accepted, uh, I put it under double quotes, gold standards. Because gold standard today, it, it need not necessarily be uh, the standard. Uh, it is based upon what we today know the best. And I'm not against histopathology, but histopathology is still a gold standard in the bio, bio, biology area. But then we get into analytical versus analytical tool versus uh, such. Uh, we have to be careful. What is gold standard really? Uh, so I, with that, I, the no question, questions here. Just a comment. We just have to be careful when comparing methodology to methodology, technology to technology, and use that as an evaluation criteria of any given uh, new technique, including Gennady's. Uh, <laughs> and, and and Chris, that's that's an excellent point. And I actually just want to add to that. Uh, you know. So, you know, here, here we are devoting, you know, you know, almost two hours to best practices in QNMR, you know, here's like, you know, here, here's a bunch of people obsessing over 1% uncertainty, you know, am I really getting all the area under the obnoxiously long Lorentzian wings, you know, all this stuff. And, and, and you realize that, at least to my knowledge, I've, I've never met any, any non NMR spectroscopist that that obsesses over the quality of their numbers as much. And from what I've seen personally, especially, you know, with some of my, I'm just gonna say it, with some of my chromatography colleagues, you know, when I look at how these guys are integrating, you know, where they're just like, um, you know, here's, the, here, here's this like funky baseline that's like nowhere near flat. Here's this like inhomogeneous peak. And it's like, you know, at, you know, 75% down, there's a shoulder. And I'm just gonna cut a straight line from this part to that part. And I'm going to base all my statistics based on that. You know, I, I think it's important to, um, to realize that, that when, when inter-technological inter uh, comparisons are being made, I think it's very important to take that stuff into account because I bet, you know, averaged internationally, that probably is going to account for a lot of the, you know, observed variability. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, on, on that same note about comparison between techniques, just just share a recent experience in which we have uh, Grignard reagents, and we just we just want to the, determine a titer. We just want to know what concentration is this reagent in the bottle, and there are, there are multiple ways to to do that. You know, you can you can do a titration, you can do um, uh, you can use probably you know IR. In our case, we were doing QNMR, and the idea was to compare results of those, all those approaches. And yeah, and the results were in general consistent. As Chris pointed out, the ones that, that have some level of subjectivity to it, like 
the end point of a titration are going to be slightly slightly over what we get for the other ones because you, you actually have to go over to, to actually get the change. Um, in the end, which one is better or, or, or you know, in this case, we don't have a gold, a gold standard for that particular application. It's just finding what can be done consistently with a methodology that is robust and how much time it takes and how much effort and human intervention it, it, it needs uh, are things just to keep in mind. I, I also want to add, I, I don't know if folks here are familiar with something called a Horwitz trumpet. Anybody? <laughs> Um, this is something I stumbled upon about a year and a half ago, but in 1980, a gentleman from the FDA, an analytical chemist by the name of uh, William Horvitz, he, he was running, a, you know, he, he had something like 100 uh, interlaboratory studies, you know, round robin studies, and he basically published a paper where he realized that there, there is a universal power law that describes the, the relative standard deviation of a measurement as a function of concentration. And over the years, they've added more and more and more interlaboratory data sets to this. And they've actually even added data sets from completely orthogonal technologies. And to the best of my knowledge, in, you know, here in you know, July 22nd, 2021, they still, all that data still is described by this universal power law. And they still can't explain why. So I just wanted to... I guess, put that on people's radar that this kind of stuff exists. And I, I don't know if NMR has entered that game yet, but it would really be interesting to see if NMR, you know, continues that trend or if, you know, or, or if that trend, you know, becomes modified once you put the NMR measurements in. Just something to think about. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, just asking if there are any other questions. Go ahead, Dave. No, that's what I was asking too. So why don't we, if there are no more questions, why don't we uh, conclude? And maybe uh, I'll turn things over to again to a last word from John. Uh, Gennady, keep obsessing. We love yes. what we do. <laughs> Absolutely, that's, that's what I wanted to hear. Uh, you know, all I can say is Gennady, Charlotte, Jose, wonderful presentations today, uh, wonderful discussion, and uh, I, I wish we could go on. I guess, uh, two, well, we've gone two hours. <laughs> yes. a, 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 absolutely great uh, presentations uh, today. Uh, looking forward to the next meeting. Please do join us, everyone, and uh, my, my, my thanks for everyone for uh, continuing to uh, participate with uh, uh, Ivan. I was just uh, Look, I was looking way out at the end of my nose a minute ago and thinking about uh, uh, next year's EMC. That's, uh, I guess, too far away to even uh, consider at this point. But uh, we're, we're going to have a great uh, uh, Ivan meeting live, and uh, we'll be in uh, Florida. Well, that, that's next March or April. We'll uh, talk more about it uh, later. But once again, thank you, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, joining us. Thank you to our speakers, and uh, have a good day, everyone. Okay, John. John just wanted to add. We had live Asilomar ENC meeting, ENC <laughs> Ivan meeting, even this year. Even when ENC was not live, we were live <laughs> from Asilomar meeting. Uh, uh, uh. Well, it, 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 it was it was live for well two or th two or three of you. Day, yes. day one done. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. But what that, that next year, I, I don't recall, is either March or April, and uh, we'll uh, I'll, I'll be able to get together once again. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. So Thank with you. that, I'll, oh, go ahead. Okay. So with that, let's close the meeting. I'll bang the gavel. Thank you, buddy. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.